A couple things. Uh, first of all, I haven't posted the video yet. I will get it posted. There uh, were two issues. One, I was out of town over the weekend, but second, there was a technical problem with the video itself, uh, which involved me not plugging in the wireless microphone. Uh, but I have a backup recording, so I had to spend some time synchronizing the recording with the video. You'll see when you watch the video, it's probably off a little bit in terms of timing, but it's pretty close. And I didn't have the time or ability to uh, get it any better than what it is. So you'll, you'll see when I get it posted. Uh, it should be posted later this afternoon. So um, that should be straightforward. Uh, second, I, I told you one thing in error last time, and I wanted to make sure I got that corrected for you. It's not a major error, but it's something that uh, affects regulation of uh, purine metabolism. And that is, um, as we are making the um, purine ring, you, I told you that the very first enzyme uh, which catalyzed the reaction prior to this one right here, <coughs> PRPP mitotransferase, that is the, the relevant enzyme. I said it was inhibited by ATP and GTP. I was incorrect. It's inhibited actually by AMP and GMP. So this is the one you recall that required, if you had both of those present, then it would, uh, the enzyme would be inhibited, but only one was present. It would only be partially inhibited. Uh, so um, that's AMP and GMP, not uh, ATP and GTP, as I said in class. You'll see in the figure, I'll show you later today, that IMP may also be involved, but we're not really uh, particularly concerned uh, with that. It's more the AMP, GMP um, uh, that we'll uh, talk about. So, and I'll correct that on the highlights as well, so you'll uh, have that down correctly. Okay. Um, well, we're actually in very good shape uh, with stuff. We've talked about de novo synthesis of the um, purines. We've talked about de novo synthesis of pyrimidines. I will uh, come back and say a little bit about a salvage synthesis of purines uh, in a bit, but I won't um, uh, do that until I finish talking about the um, deoxyribonucleotide metabolism. So deoxyribonucleotide metabolism, uh, extends this uh, concern I had, or not concern, but this observation I had earlier about cells regulating levels of these individual nucleotides very, very carefully. Um, it extends also into the um, uh, deoxyribonucleotide metabolism as well. And you'll find that the nomenclature uh, is a little difficult. This is one lecture where I frequently have to be very careful, uh, more careful than usual, what I say. So uh, the, wor the words uh, become difficult. Well, the operative enzyme that is um, essential for this conversion or the synthesis of deoxyribonucleotides is the enzyme known as ribonucleotide reductase. Ribonucleotide reductase is um, an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of ADP to DA, uh, well, this, yeah, to DADP, from GDP to DGDP, from CDP to DCDP, and from UDP to DUDP. You'll notice that T is not up there, and metabolism of thymidine nucleotides comes from DUDP, and we'll see how that uh, occurs later on. But this one enzyme controls the synthesis of all four of these um, uh, deoxyribonucleotides. You'll notice also that the diphosphate is the form on which it operates. Okay. It works on the diphosphate, not the triphosphate, not the monophosphate, but the diphosphate. All right. <coughs> this reaction um, is a fairly complicated reaction, and it is uh, technically a reduction because we're converting an oxygen. I'm sorry, we're basically converting a hydroxyl to um, an, uh, a hydrogen. So that is technically a reduction uh, that is occurring in this process, which means there has to be there have to be electron sources. And uh, I'll show you that as we get going on. To go from the <clears throat> deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates to the deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates, uh, we have to invoke the enzyme um, nucleotide diphosphokinase, or NDPK. As I said last time, all of the diphosphates of all the nucleotides are converted to triphosphates by NDPK. Now, this particular thing right here, you'll, I, I hope you, uh, well, I'll show you later, this is not a one-step process. This is a multi-step process in going from DUDP to TTP, and we'll talk about that. So even though this looks like it's a one-step process, it technically uh, is not. Okay, um, so that's the general overview then of deoxyribonucleotide um, synthesis. 
The enzyme that we um, have to, uh, that, that we are interested in here is called ribonucleotide reductase, and it's a very interesting and surprisingly complicated enzyme for its, um, uh, for what it, I guess for its size. It consists of two sets of, dimer, or, uh, two sets of dimers, uh, one set that are identical subunits called large subunits, and another set of subunits that are identical that are called small subunits. And of course, that's based on their size, no surprise. The R1 subunit is the location where the active site is found, but the active site actually relies ultimately on radicals that are generated in the small subunits. Now, this is a very complicated process by which this occurs. You can breathe easily that we're not going to track it. But suffice it to say that there is literally an electrical connection that links from here all the way up to the active site. Okay? The radical that is created here um, in the uh, small subunit occurs on a tyrosine. It's called a tyrosyl radical, as you can see here. And that radical is ultimately propagated all the way up to the active site where the reaction actually uh, occurs. Okay? So uh, we'll say uh, a little bit uh, about that. I'm not going to do a lot on mechanism, but I will tell you that. OK, um, R2 subunit. The R2 subunit is the place where a tyrosine radical is uh, created. That radical involves removal of a hydrogen from the um, hydroxyl group on the tyrosine. And all this figure is trying to show you is that there are some nearby electron acceptors that are capable, uh, I'm sorry, electron um, um, donors that are capable of extracting that, uh, hydro that, that hydrogen from the hydroxyl over here. Okay? So uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. All right, now, I, we're not going to go through that. I'm not, you're not going to be responsible for the mechanism. So I'm only showing you this mechanism just so you can see a little bit of the complexity um, of what's involved here. What we have um, playing roles in the active site are a carboxyl group and a couple of sulfhydryls, so that you can see here. And not surprisingly, these um, 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 groups, and by the way, we're looking at the active site. We're not looking now at the tyrosyl radical. We're now looking at the active site. Here is our target ribonucleoside diphosphate shown here. And here is the setup as uh, we begin. Okay? That process um, moves through several stages, ultimately removing it, resulting in the removal of a, uh, an oxygen uh, from here, as you can see, and leaving behind an unpaired electron. That removal of that oxygen and uh, that hydroxyl group ultimately results in the formation of water. and a uh, sulfur minus ion. We see the rolls of the disulfide coming up. And ultimately, that hydrogen is replaced, and we are left with a deoxyribonucleotide. Now, the deoxyribonucleotides, you recall, are those which um, lack an oxygen at position number two. And so there's our end product. There was our starting product. OK, now, the synthesis of thymidine is, uh, oh, by the way, actually, that's, I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm sorry. Let me back up. Um, the book is out of sequence here. So um, we're here. OK, so way down here, figure 2516. We have to now look at the ribonucleotide reductase enzyme. And the book puts it in, the, in a section called regulatory um, regulation of the pathway. And that's because this enzyme does, in fact, have important regulation. But it, it actually is more relevant when we talk about the actual reaction being catalyzed. So that's why I'm jumping to it here. We're looking now at the large subunit of the um, ribonucleotide uh, reductase. The nomenclature here, as you will see, gets a little confusing. So um, I'm going to hope to step you through um, an understanding of that nomenclature. We see two identical subunits. And we see that on each of the subunits, each subunit has three specific places on them. That's what I'm going to call them. One of which is the active site. Okay? You remember that the active site is where the reaction is catalyzed in any enzyme. So when you hear the term active site, that's where the reaction is being catalyzed. There are, in addition to the active site, two 
other allos or two allosteric sites, and it's their names that cause confusion. One allosteric site is called the activity site, and this is where I always trip up. I start saying act active site when I mean activity site. The activity site, I'll explain in a second. The other allosteric site is called the specificity site. Okay? So three sites, an active site, and then two allosteric sites, one called the activity site, and one called the specificity site. Now, why does it need two allosteric sites? All right? Well, it turns out that the enzyme <clears throat> uses two sites for the following reasons. At the, allosteric, uh, at the activity site, that is basically an on-off switch. An on-off switch. If the activity site binds ATP, the enzyme is in the on state. It's turned on. If the enzyme, on the other hand, binds DATP, the enzyme is turned off. Now, this sort of makes some sense because the more DATP you have, the more uh, deoxyribonucleotides you have, and so you don't want to continue making more. So DATP functions as a measure of the levels of the deoxyribonucleotides. When it gets too high, it binds to the activity site and turns the enzyme off. On the other hand, if the cell has a lot of energy, a lot of ATP. If the ATP is the most dominant thing there, then ATP is going to bind and say, hey, we've got a lot of energy. Let's make some nucleotides. Maybe we can divide, et cetera, et cetera. So having ATP turn it on makes very good sense. Okay. Now, the specificity site is um, not quite so clear cut. The specificity site, it turns out, is actually very complicated. And I'm going to give you a sort of a simplification about how the specificity site works. Okay? <clears throat> Keep in mind that the activity site binds ribonucleoside diphosphates. ADP, CDP, GDP, uh, UDP. All right? This guy up here bound triphosphates, either DATP or ATP. These guys down here, all right, the specificity sites also bind triphosphates. So the only part that binds diphosphates is the activity site, uh, is the active site. See, there I just did it. The active site. Okay? The specificity site binds triphosphates. Well, what does the specificity site do? <clears throat> As you might expect, the specificity site helps change what substrates the enzyme prefers to work on. It helps to change what substrates the enzyme prefers to work on. All right, well, what does that mean? Well, let's imagine that the cell is making too many guanine, or let's say too many DGTPs. The cell's got a lot of DGTP. All right? Remember, we have to have balance, and so the cell doesn't want to have too much DGTP. If DGTP becomes high, it's going to be the most likely thing to bind to the specificity site. Okay? Everybody with me? So too much DGTP, DGTP binds here. DGTP, you will notice, is a purine. And the complements to purines are, of course, pyrimidines. When DGTP binds, it favors the active site binding to purines. Uh, to pyrimidines, okay? the complementary ones. So if I bind DGTP here, I will favor binding UDP and CDP here. We're trying to get balance. We've got too much purines. We need to start making some pyrimidines. Okay? If I bind DATP here, that's also a purine, same thing will happen. UDP, CDP will be favored up here. All right? On the other hand, if I start making too much DCTP, it binds here. It's a pyrimidine. It's going to favor the binding of purines up here, GDP or ADP. Now, I'm taking some liberties with the actual specificities. But in general, that's how the enzyme itself is regulated. Okay. 
Now, it usually has, is a point where people have a lot of questions, so I'll slow down, stop, and take questions. <coughs> I only said active versus activity site once. I think it's a record for me, so. Yes? <laughs> Do they both need to be bound? Okay. So in general, you'll find that the cell will, will um, have enough ATP or DATP to bind. If you have nothing bound, the question I get is, is the enzyme still active? And it is, as far as I know, in a much less active state. That is, it's not nearly as activated or as, as ready to catalyze reactions if it has nothing bound there. If there's nothing bound here, then this enzyme is going to be pretty much free to just catalyze whatever it wants to. So if there's nothing bound to specificity site, that would really indicate the cell is low on DNTPs, N meaning any nucleotide, deoxyribonucleoside triphosphate, then uh, it would go ahead and, and have no preference. Make sense? Yes? Okay, so good question. So DUTP will bind here, um, and TTP can actually bind here as well. So in either case, you could have either one of those. Okay? Yes? Uh, if you had a purine on one of the specificity sites and then a pyridine on the other, would it deactivate those? Oh, yeah. That would obviously complicate things. Uh, <laughs> so my prediction would be that each subunit would, would, would probably catalyze things independently of the other. Uh, and you're always going to have some sort of mixing and matching inside the cells. We think about this, well, I've got too much, I'll always have this one versus that one. And that's, the reality is something different from that. Okay? No other questions? Well, that was quick. Easy? Okay. Well, uh, that's uh, what the enzyme uh, does. It's very interesting and unusual enzyme. Um, this... Uh, attempts to show you what I talk to you in very simple terms in terms of words. If you want to try to figure it out from what they've done there, good luck. But um, I, as I said, I, I have simplified that to some uh, extent. Okay, um, let's see here. Let's go back and talk now about the synthesis of DTTP, or as your book calls it, TTP. Okay. There are people that get very upset with whether you call it TTP or DTTP. The purists insist that it should be called TTP. And I, I know some of you have seen uh, that I post uh, many of my lectures on YouTube. And so uh, I got an absolutely just flaming email from somebody. <laughs> it's a true story. Absolutely flaming email from somebody because I had dared to say it was DTTP, even though I explained it exactly as I'm doing here, that, you know, it's really... Uh, a historical nomenclature uh, sort of thing. But they were very, very unhappy with me that I would dare to call the thing DTTP. <laughs> Some people don't get out enough, I think, so. <laughs> okay. Um, the synthesis of DTTP um, is interesting and odd, all right? It comes from D-U-M-P. I like that. It's dump, right? I got to take a dump, right? All right? No, I'm just making thymidine, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Be a great joke, wouldn't it? All right. Uh, maybe not. Well, I haven't talked about dump. Where did dump come from? Well, dump, of course, is the deoxy form of the uridine nucleotide. All right? But if you think about the scheme that I've just talked to you about, I said we went from UDP to DUDP, right? Well, you would think the logical step would be to go from DUDP to DUMP by taking off a phosphate, but in fact, that's not what the cell does. The cell converts DUDP to DUTP. You might say, well, why does the cell do that? Well, remember that nucleoside diphosphokinase, NDPK, works on all diphosphates. It's going to grab it. It's going to do its thing before the cell has a chance to do anything else with it. So it's not surprising in sort of hindsight that it goes from DUDP to DUTP. But the surprising thing is DUTP is problematic for the cell. DUTP can be recognized by, D, by DNA polymerase and treated very much as thymidine is. That is TTP or DTTP. Okay? 
Well, that's fine, except for DUTP is not nearly as chemically stable as DTTP is. That's why we have DTTP in our DNA, not DUTP. Okay? So cells don't want to put the uridine nucleotides into their DNA. All right? So therefore, what cells do is the following. We go from DUDP to DUTP, and then it's got an enzyme called DUTPase that converts DUTP down to DUMP. Yes, Jim? That's a mouthful. Can you repeat that a little slow? A little slow, okay? Real first. All right. <laughs> Let me, let me give you the path. Let me give you the path, okay? All right. So that is a mouthful, okay? <clears throat> Just stand away for a laugh. It's kind of like comedians do, right? <laughs> okay, I don't know. All right, so you've got DUDP. DUDP is a product of action of ribonucleotide reductase. In the cell, DUDP is converted to DUTP. Okay? Cell doesn't want to have DUTP floating around, so it has an enzyme called DUTPase. And DUTPase converts DUTP to dump. So what I've just shown you is how you get to dump, first of all. Everybody with me? OK. So that's a circuitous route. And yes, it is a mouthful. Okay, That circuitous route is energy intensive. We had to go from a diphosphate to a triphosphate, and then we turn around and we clip two phosphates off of that. Meaning that making of thymidine nucleotides is energetically intensive. OK. Now, we are at dump. All right. When we get to dump, we have um, this, um, well, let's back it up over here. What has to happen? Let me show you what the, what the overall process is. In the overall process, we're taking DUMP and we're putting a methyl group right here. Methyl group right here. Yes, sir? So when you take the phosphates off, is that energy just lost or is it used for something? Nope, that energy is lost. Yep, that energy is lost. And the reason it's lost is that you have, a, uh, you have an enzyme in the cells called phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase will take pyrophosphate and split it in two. And so the energy is just completely lost. So it's not, it's not recaptured. And uh, the cell then, once they've made DTMP or TMP, as you see here, then they have to go back and put two more phosphates on. So it's just lost energy. Yeah. But it's worth it to the cell because the cell wants to have thymidine nucleotides. All right? So that energy investment, cells don't invest energy in, in processes that aren't beneficial to them. The cell is doing this for an important reason, thymidine nucleotides are more stable, much more stable, than are um, a, um, a DUMP, OK? All right. Now, this guy over here uh, has gained a methyl group getting from here over to here, all right? The methyl group has come from this mouthful of a name that you saw earlier in the class. And we're going to abbreviate this mouthful of a name and call it tetrahydrofolate. The last part here, tetrahydrofolate. Tetrahydrofolate is one of the compounds that we have in the cell that we refer to as being methyl donors, or one carbon donors. They're not always methyl groups. They're one carbon donors. One carbon donors um, do as exactly as uh, explained. In this case, it's donating a methyl group. The methyl is coming from this carbon right here. You can see the reaction going on. And we end up with that guy over there. Okay. The product of that reaction is DTMP and a molecule called dihydrofolate. Okay. Dihydrofolate. Now, um, dihydrofolate. Uh, turns out to be a dead end if cells don't recycle it. So just like cells only had a fixed amount of NAD and FAD that they had to recycle once they made NADH and FADH2, so too do they have to recycle their dihydrofolate. If they don't recycle the dihydrofolate, they run out of tetrahydrofolate, 
And that would, of course, absolutely nail the synthesis of thymidine nucleotides. Okay? <coughs> Makes sense? Okay. Now, that last thing I just described to you is an important consideration. All right? Dihydrofolate must be reduced back to tetrahydrofolate, and there's actually a rather lengthy process. The, the molecule they call tetrahydrofolate here is slightly different than the one we had, so there's more in steps involved in getting back to the one that we were at. All right? But suffice it to say, if we cannot convert dihydrofolate back into tetrahydrofolate, we will be in trouble. And that actually turns out to be good, because we use that strategy in actually designing drugs to knock out cancer cells. The molecules aminopterin and methotrexate inhibit the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase. Now that's the enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. If we inhibit this enzyme, the cells start accumulating dihydrofolate and their thymidine synthesis ceases. Therefore, they can't make DNA. They can't, therefore, they can't replicate. And if they can't replicate and they're a cancer cell, I've just killed a cancer cell. Okay? Now you're wondering, what was, what's all this business over here? Okay? As I said, to get from tetrahydrofolate to the molecule we talked about, it's another step. But we're going to treat this as if it's the same as this for the moment. Okay? All right. The important matter is right here, not over here. If we inhibit this enzyme, we cannot get back to our tetrahydrofolate, and therefore we cannot synthesize thymidine nucleotides. Okay? You'll notice also, and by the way, the way that I should have given you this earlier, the enzyme that catalyzes the synthesis of DTMP is known as thymidylate synthase. Thymidylate synthase. Fluorouracil will inhibit this enzyme. It inhibits it because the fluorouracil gets incorporated in to make fluorodeoxyuridylate, and that is an inhibitor of the enzyme. It's another anti-cancer strategy because I am specifically knocking out thymidine nucleotides. Now, the, the strategy for doing this is actually the fact that many types of cancer involve replication processes that are faster than the replication processes in normal cells. Okay? So, cancer cells that are dividing more rapidly than normal cells are more susceptible to this drug than normal cells are. So one of the strategies that are used in giving this drug uh, to people, and by the way, this drug is used for things besides cancer, I I'll point out. You'll see it used in other places. But from an anti-cancer perspective, this drug is given in fairly large doses so that you inhibit all of the dihydrofolate reductase in cells. Well, if you didn't do anything else, you would kill the person, okay? Because cells have to divide, cells have to make DNA, et cetera, et cetera, okay? This is given for a short period of time, and then it is literally flushed out of the body with other compounds. Now, the hope is that in the time that this drug was in the cancer cells, it actually killed the cancer cells, and it killed more cancer cells than it killed regular cells. It's a kind of a blunt way of trying to kill something, but if you have no other ways of getting at the cancer cell, this actually does have some effect. The downside is it has fairly serious side effects. The side effects, a lot of nausea, uh, hair loss, etc. And so when you see people on anti-cancer medications, they might be taking this compound. There's many other compounds they could take, but they might be taking this one because this one does, in fact, cause some severe side effects because it's a fairly blunt approach. Yes, sir? Uh, does this increase your chance of mutation because of messing Well, that's a very good question. Could this increase your chance of mutation because this is messing with your nucleotides? Typically, this is given for a relatively short period of time 
so that I would suspect any imbalances that arise uh, over that time, if there were any, would likely uh, be straightened out once everything was restored to normal. So I don't think that would have a significant effect, but it's a good question. Good thought. Yes, Robert. Um, so do you catch yourself in the Is the cancer cells dihydrofolate reductase more susceptible? No, it's not. It's identical to the one in regular cells. Okay, so how is it that cancer cells are more susceptible than regular cells? By virtue of the fact that they're making DNA faster and they will run out of thymidine nucleotides faster. So it's the, that you would do this on an aggressive cancer that's dividing rapidly. That would be the strategy for using this because if you had a slow moving cancer, like let's say a prostate cancer or something, this would not be a very good strategy. Yes? Uh, well, if the enzyme is inactive, then it would already be inhibited, right? Yeah. So we're, we're trying to stop the enzyme from functioning. Yeah, that's the strategy. And this enzyme isn't really allosterically controlled. It's on all the time. So it's not, unless we do something to it, it's not going to have uh, an off opportunity. I see a hand? OK. All right. So that's um, what uh, happens with uh, the um, control there of the, um, and we don't need to worry about that. This is, um, these are the structures of aminopterin and methotrexate. Uh, as seen there, as I said, uh, methotrexate uh, is uh, not uncommonly used uh, as an anti-cancer drug. Um, this guy can also be used in some cases uh, as an antibiotic uh, to kill bacterial cells. Bacterial cells uh, do not have the ability uh, to make I'm sorry, they have to make their own folates. They don't have the ability, they, they don't get them in their diet like we do. We get folates in our diet. And so if they have to make their own, this guy, this guy inhibits the synthesis of folates in bacteria. So in some cases, it's actually used as an antibiotic. And trimethoprim, I won't talk about that there. Okay. All right. Well, the last things I want to say about nucleotide metabolism involve regulation and some consideration about how they're broken down and salvaged. Okay. So um, I mentioned before, and I'll just briefly mention it here, you guys have seen ATCAs before. ATCAs is the enzyme that you recall that was the feedback inhibited enzyme involved in pyrimidine metabolism. CTP, which is the end product of pyrimidine biosynthesis, is the inhibitor of the enzyme, whereas ATP is an activator. And I said that this enzyme played an important role in balancing the relative amounts of purines and pyrimidines. Okay, so it plays a very important role in balancing the relative amounts of purines and pyrimidines. Purine biosynthesis is controlled by uh, the enzyme, and this shows two different places, but essentially the enzyme that's important is the one right here. This is the PRPP amidotransferase, and PRPP amidotransferase is inhibited by AMP and GMP. IMP plays a role over here, we won't worry about that. AMP and GMP are the inhibitors of PRPP amidotransferase. You recall that it took both of them binding to the enzyme to turn the enzyme off. If only one was present, the enzyme's activity was turned down, but it was not turned off. And that was important consideration so that the cell could be able to balance the relative amounts of AMP and GMP. The actual balancing of AMP and GMP is accomplished by the two enzymes here. Uh, which I have not named, IMP uh, going the AMP pathway, IMP going the GMP pathway. So AMP is an allosteric inhibitor of its own synthesis. It's a feedback inhibitor. GMP is a feedback inhibitor of its own synthesis. So now we see that these guys are balanced. So we've balanced A with G. We've balanced purines with pyrimidines. You may recall that when I talked about CTP synthase, I said that it was inhibited by the end product of its um, uh, reaction, which is CTP. So CTP synthase helps to regulate or balance the amount of U and C. So we've got balance for U and C, we've got balance for A and G, and we've got balance for purine versus pyrimidine. Now today, I talked about ribonucleotide reductase, and ribonucleotide reductase, you, I hope you start to see, now balances the four DNTPs. All right? It's a little cruder, all right, because we're balancing basically purines versus pyrimidines in there. But since the levels of these in cells never get too high anyway, 
They're not nearly as high as the ribonucleoside diphosphates compared to the deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates. That's not a problem. Okay, so those are the regulations and the balances um, that occur there. I know I'm going a little fast, so I'll slow down and ask if you have questions or if you want me to repeat that or whatever you would like. I won't dance. I think my singing is bad. You, you ain't seen nothing. Yes, sir. IMP is inosine monophosphate. It is that intermediate on the way to making AMP and GMP. It technically is a purine. And as I said, we'll actually see uh, I appearing in transfer RNAs uh, later. But it's just simply an intermediate on, the, on that pathway. No questions? OK, that's good. All right, so the last thing I'll talk about today then uh, is the um, uh, salvage. And salvage happens as a result of a variety of processes, um, one of the most important being catabolism. That is the breakdown of nucleotides. Now, the first thing I'll talk about is um, a, uh, an important breakdown pathway. And this breakdown pathway actually um, interfaces with a couple of human diseases. Okay? One, the, the, the most severe uh, of these human diseases is actually um, uh, caused by the deficiency of this enzyme right here, adenosine uh, deaminase. Adenosine deaminase catalyzes the conversion of adenosine into inosine, and uh, this is a breakdown pathway. So we're basically taking and starting with, we've got too much AMP in the cell, the cell is breaking it down to a variety of compounds, ultimately uh, to uh, uric acid, as we'll see. So this is a mechanism of getting rid of too much purines, too many purines. All right? If the body, and there's a genetic disease called sudden, uh, a severe combined immune deficiency. It's the disease that's also given the name bubble boy for the kid that lived in a sterile bubble for most of his life. Uh, before he finally succumbed to the disease. Severe combined immune deficiency arises from a deficiency of this enzyme. What this enzyme does, uh, where this enzyme turns out to be fairly important is in immune set system cells. If this enzyme is deficient, what happens is DATP accumulates. And you, can, it's, you don't see a direct link here, and the direct link isn't, isn't even completely known. But DATP accumulates if this enzyme is deficient. If we have too many purines, we have too much DATP. Well, in the immune system cells, as DATP accumulates, what happens to enzymes? What's going to happen to nucleotide biosynthesis if DATP accumulates? What enzyme is going to get inhibited? Ribonucleotide reductase. That was the off switch, right? So in immune system cells, they lack this enzyme. Their DATP levels go off. They shut off their DNA synthesis, and the immune system basically dies. Okay? As a consequence, uh, people lacking this enzyme have no immune defenses um, to protect them against the environment. That's what happened with the bubble boy. His condition was recognized at about the time of his birth. He was put into a sterile chamber uh, where he lived for about 13 or 14 years before he finally uh, died, and they finally did let him out of the bubble. But he spent his whole life in the bubble because exposure to a single bacterium would kill him. Uh, no way of fighting that uh, the, off the, the infections that would happen. Okay, So it's a severe uh, problem. It's one that people uh, have tried and with some limited success to uh, tackle using um, the um, a genetic therapy where they actually insert a, um, a functional de adenosine deaminase into cells and in some cases, there have been some successes uh, in treating this disease with that. Yes, ma'am. Can you explain again how that leads to having no resistance? How it leads to having no resistance? Certainly. So it turns out that in immune cells, when this, this enzyme is deficient, the levels of DATP go high. And high DATP in any cell will turn off ribonucleotide reductase, because that's the off switch. As a consequence of that being high, there are no uh, deoxyribonucleotides that are being made. As a consequence, the cell can't replicate and the cell dies. So that's what happens. And that's why the immune system is the primary effector, because the immune system is the place where the DATP levels 
go high. As I said, it's not uh, completely understood why, why simply there. That's another hand over here. Yes? Yeah, uh, why can't they do a bone marrow transfusion? I think in some cases that's, that's been another strategy to do that. Uh, so um, one of the things that um, has, uh, with bone marrow that you have are opportunities to uh, basically replace an immune system. That's done oftentimes in uh, some cancer therapies where they will completely irradiate and kill the bone marrow and then give a, a transplant with that. They're not without problems as well. Uh, so there are complications arising from those. But I think in some cases they have done that, what you said exactly. Yes, sir. That's, that's what actually what killed the boy. He got a bone marrow transplant. Is that right? From his sister that was uh, Ah, was. okay. Well, there's definitely a complication there. So, uh, but I, I wasn't aware of that. I thought there was a, he, he had somehow acquired an infection. I didn't. From, I think from the From the trans, okay. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. Other comments or questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. It's called severe combined immune deficiency. It's usually abbreviated SCID. Okay? SCID. Okay. Um, I said there were two diseases relevant to this pathway. The more severe of the two is the one I just described to you. Um, the other one is the disease gout. Everybody's heard of gout? Okay. You think of gout as like an old person's disease, and it may be a little bit more of a problem in, in older people, although uh, gout can strike anyone. Gout um, arises because of overproduction of uric acid. Overproduction of uric acid. Well, how do you overproduce uric acid? Well, in the old days, the way that you overproduced uric acid was you had what was known as a rich diet. Gout was known as a rich man's disease. And diets high in things like red wine, red meat, and things that the rich people were able to do uh, at the expense of poor people in the, old, in the old days resulted in them consuming considerable amounts of purines. All right? So the more purines you consume, the more you run this pathway. And the more you run this pathway, the more commonly you start to accumulate uric acid. You'll notice that AMP is going out this way and guanine is going down the very same direction. The body is trying to get rid of too many of what it has or too many purines. Okay? If uric acid ionizes, everything's okay. Uric acid doesn't ionize a lot. And so uric acid will frequently crystallize. And when it crystallizes, it actually tends to crystallize in the lower portions of the body where the crystals get pulled down to. As things start to precipitate out of solution, they start to getting pulled down to the lowest point on your body. And gout um, is probably the one disease that people almost always laugh at. And if you've ever had it, it's not funny because the place where you get the most pain is in your big toe. Okay? And it can be excruciating. You probably see in the old comedies, they would always have somebody with gout and they're trying to do something with their, their toe, et cetera, because that's the lowest point, and that's the place where the, um, the crystals actually settle. Um, the crystals um, hit nerve endings is what they do. And so they, they crystallize at the nerves and stimulate those nerves, great pain response, et cetera, et cetera. That is not something, I've never had it, but uh, that is not something that from what I understand from anybody who's ever had it, that they want to um, have uh, anything associated with. Today's diets are richer than diets in old days, and so gout is much more common. It's not just known as a rich person's disease. Uh, again, you get older, you may be a little bit more susceptible to, doubt, to, to a gout, so it's possible that you uh, will get gout. The interesting thing about gout is that there appears to be a health benefit to it. Okay? The health benefit to gout. All right? They have compared uh, the people who get gout with the general population and have discovered that people who get gout tend to have a lower frequency of developing multiple sclerosis. Okay? Yeah. Lower, uh, lower frequency of developing multiple sclerosis. Now, the thinking is that uric acid acts something like an antioxidant, and as a consequence, high levels of uric acid may somehow be preventing uh, the creation of reactive oxygen species that give rise to multiple sclerosis. There are the, the, the full causes of multiple sclerosis are not known, uh, and so this is speculation. 
but the link between uric acid levels, uh, the inverse relationship between uric acid levels and um, multiple sclerosis occurrence are uh, interesting or intriguing in that, in that sense. To, uh, yes, question? Just, just coming yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah, that's just, just where I was headed to. So um, to treat uh, gout, what uh, medications are actually given are, oh, oh, thought I had it on there. They actually give a compound called allopurinol. And I thought I had it on here. Uh, yeah, there it is, right there. So what they're inhibiting is xanthine oxidase. And xanthine oxidase, you will notice, catalyzes both this reaction and this reaction. So by stopping the synthesis of uric acid, this ends up being excreted, and this is not as much of a problem in terms of crystallizing as uric acid is. Allopurinol is a, is a fairly effective uh, treatment for gout, uh, it's my understanding. Does anybody know anybody who's had gout? Yeah. They don't test for it. They will know. If you have gout, you will know. You'll go in and say, like, I mean, it's very, very painful uh, feeling in the big toe. Yes, back in the back. It doesn't get rid of what's there. Right. And that's going to take a while. They'll probably get people off their feet during that time um, and hopefully get things redistributed as much as possible. But yeah, that's, that's a, a nasty uh, compound, a nasty, a nasty disease. It inhibits, it inhibits this enzyme right here, xanthine oxidase. Xanthine oxidase is involved both in the synthesis and the breakdown of xanthine. So Catalyzes two reactions. I'm sorry? Xanthine excreted or hypoxanthine? So hypoxanthine is what's excreted. Okay. All right, maybe that's a good place to stop. I'll finish up the, talking about the um, uh, synthesis uh, salvage next time.